coming up next on Another View of Foodie's Delight. We're going to spend the next hour talking about memories that make your mouth water and invoke pleasant thoughts about things in your past. They're called food memories, and our guests will share why these memories help keep us grounded and bring family and friends together. And since Thanksgiving is right around the corner, we'll share some tips on getting dinner on the table without losing your mind. The founder of Coastal Pies and the owners of Now You're Cooking are with us stirring up recipes and memories. Another view is next, right after this news from NPR. Discussing today's topics from an African-American perspective, this is Another View. And good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Another View. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. I want you to do me a favor, and don't do this if you're driving, but if you're sitting somewhere safe, get lost in your memory for just a moment. Close your eyes. Think about this. Think about something pleasant. Now answer this question. Does it involve food? Food memories create tradition, or does tradition create food memories? We've got three true foodies in our studio to help us sort it all out. Please welcome the founder of Coastal Pies, Regina Brayboy. Hi, Regina. Hi, Welcome to the show. Uh, And the owners of Now You're Cooking Culinary Institute, Chef Dedra Blount. Hi, Chef. Welcome back. Thank you for having me. (laughs) And her twin, Deborah Brabson. Hi. Hi, Deborah. How are you? I'm great. How are you? Good. I am so good. Now, I want to invite our audience right away um, to call us at 440 Two six six five or one eight hundred nine four zero two two four zero. Call us and tell us about your favorite food memories. Um, we had a great discussion in our pre-production um, meeting today, and I want to share too um, before I get you all because I want to ask each of you what your food memory is. So, our audio engineer Victor Bowen he said every first day of school, his mother made a breakfast casserole. And it was made of broccoli, cheese, sausage with a bread base. And it was for every first day of school. And so that's a memory that comes back for him. Lisa Godley, our producer, said that her grandma, Benny, always cooked for Thanksgiving. And that was the time when the entire family came together. And she said the older kids would do puppet shows for the younger kids. And the men would go off and watch football. And it just brought a huge smile to her face. So my favorite food memory is for um, Christmas morning. My mother started baking German chocolate cakes and she made everything from scratch, you know, melting the chocolate and the fresh coconut and the whole nine. So the only time we got German chocolate cake was Christmas morning and your birthday. (laughs) So every Christmas morning we would eat German chocolate cake and bacon for breakfast. Wow. (laughs) I'm coming to your house. I know. (laughs) And so that just brings back some great memories. So Regina, what's your favorite food memory? Well, you know, uh, uh, my favorite food memory is certainly the fact that my mother made great pies and she also made great rolls and so we it was just a regular tradition for us mm-hmm. particularly on Sundays um, holidays that we always had you know great pies and also we had great rolls but it's been supplanted by um, a memory uh, not really supplanted but I will add on to mm-hmm. uh, the fact that I was with some friends over the weekend down in, in South Carolina on Kiowa Island and I they talked me into baking pies and I and I baked some pies and these ladies attacked my pies. I mean I kept saying the pie is supposed to cool down and they were ready with their forks and so that just creates such a wonderful food memory for me. But I think the great thing about food memories is that we're constantly creating them all the time. All the I think time. which is really wonderful. Chef Dedra, what's your favorite food memory? I know you cook all the time, but <laughs> but what what brings it home to you in terms of my grandmother is my culinary inspiration. She's the reason why I, um, I do what I do and she didn't allow many of her grandchildren in the kitchen with her because it was really her sanctuary Mm -hmm. but my sister and I would try to get in her kitchen every Saturday night she would make rolls um, for the family and then for the big family dinner and she allowed us to come in and get one ball of dough a piece and we would play with it and we tried to figure out she would let us bake it and everything but we never let it rise so it was flat and just <laughs> awkward we used to call them rock biscuits mm-hmm. you know and oh, we would just great. and and so even now to this day i have my grandmother's roll recipe and it's what i make 
But we always go back. We're four years old, and that little piece of dough that she let us shape off every Saturday, and we made rock biscuits. <laughs> <laughs> so do you make a rock biscuit now? Just for no, <laughs> no, those rolls melt in your mouth. I can tell you. It doesn't taste right anything now. like it did. Oh, <laughs> when well. I was four. What I make about the rock you, Deborah? Biscuits. I make the rock biscuits. You make the rock biscuits. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, you all are twins. But do we you are. have a separate food memory? That- yes, I do. Um, Dedrick does not eat potato salad, and I oh. do. And I'm very particular about it because on Saturday night, my grandmother would make potato salad for the next day. But when we got to her house in Norfolk on 35th Street to pick up the potato salad, it was warm. Mm. And I don't eat cold potato salad to this very day because I always ate it warm at her house. I wouldn't eat it on Sunday. I had to have it on Saturday night. On Saturday night. So even now, you'll catch me sneaking in the microwave. (laughs) I don't like cold potato. I just don't like it. But... It just reminds me so much of Saturday night at my grandma's house. Wow. Yep. Well, all each of you are utilizing your food memories and everything else in your new businesses. And Regina, I have got to ask you, for those of my audience who are unaware, Regina is a, um, uh, a, a business executive. She was our chief operating officer here at WHRO for several years. Um, you used to be at VIT. I mean, you were the, the corporate guru. And now you're baking pies? I'm baking pies. <laughs> <laughs> and very well, How I might did add. that happen? <laughs> Tell us that, man. You're truly following your passion now, yeah, aren't it's you? It's really about following my passion and also the whole idea of creating something that's my own. I think that's that's a neat thing to do. And I just find that when I'm rolling in the dough, it is so <laughs> relaxing. Literally <laughs> rolling, rolling in, the dough. in the dough. It is so <laughs> relaxing. And I really do believe pie is kind of a complete and perfect food because there's so much you can do with pie. I mean, you can take it everywhere from savory to dessert pies. You can do hand pies pies um you can do pot pies and quiches and there's just so many wow. different things it's a very creative food and um i just think it's a wonderful food and so i really wanted to really bring it back in a way because a lot of us i first of all i thought everybody grew up eating good pie and i also thought everybody grew up with really good food mm-hmm. and then you run into people and you realize that's really not true mm-hmm. and a lot of people will say well I, I like pie, but I don't eat the crust. And I'm going, well, you really not had really good pie <laughs> crust. Because if you have good pie crust, you really go for the crust. Mm-hmm. And so I just realized there was just so much about pie that I thought, well, you know, we need to do a pie renaissance because pie is really, really good. And I just wanted to be able to create that for people. And every time I mention something to people about pie, it makes them smile. And now when I show up places <laughs> without a pie... <laughs> It's not a good thing. Well, so at any rate, <laughs> you're the pie lady now, right? I'm the pie lady. Yes, you are. And so my license plate is I do pie. I do pie. I do pie. Yes, you do. Yeah. Oh, gosh. That is And I great. call my business Coastal Pies because mm-hmm. I just feel like pie is something that is a coast-to-coast kind of tradition. And I just want to... Because everybody loves a good pie. Everybody loves a good pie. Regardless of what kind. They really, really do. Mm -hmm. And so, but I think, but it's very difficult to find fresh, you know, hand, good Mm -hmm. pie, you know, where the crust is hand rolled and made. Mm -hmm. It's, it's very difficult. I mean, you know, you go in the grocery store, it's either frozen or, you know, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, no butter and all that kind of stuff. And so, I mean, it truly, people get amazed when they um, eat pie that really, um, you know, comes from with fresh crust and fresh ingredients. And I use all fresh ingredients as well. So, wow. 440 2665 or 1 800 940 2240. Join us and let's talk about your food memories. Carolyn joins us from Columbia, South Carolina. <laughs> Hi, Carolyn, you're on the air. Hi, I am so excited. <laughs> For, to be a part of this radio show or just to listen. I met Thank Regina you. this weekend at uh, the Kiowa Jazz Festival, but my favorite food memory started with sweet potato pies with my grandmother. They were absolutely mm. fabulous. And I thought I would never, ever capture that uh, taste again until I tasted Regina's sweet potato crustata mm. and then her apple crustata. And uh, I tell you, I love my grandmother, and she's gone, but Regina tops that. Oh, wow. That's a compliment, (laughs) Regina. That's great. (laughs) Carolyn, let me ask you something around that, though. What else around that pie? What was was the the thing, besides the taste of the food, what was the other memory Mm -hmm. that went with that? Uh, It was so creamy, so sweet. It got everyone talking around the table about just 
how good it was, and then we said some things that we really shouldn't say on the air about how good it was. But <laughs> Regina can write it down and pass it around on a piece of paper. <laughs> I, I told her I wasn't going to out her on the air. So. That's right. <laughs> but it, uh, I'm telling you, she has a, a club, and I was hesitant before because when she was just talking about it, but we forced her, made her feel really, really bad, so she finally got up from the table playing cards and made the sweet potato crustata. And I'm telling you, I wanted to attack her. I wanted to move next door. I cut a piece, and I brought it home to my children. My granddaughter, who's never met Regina, called her Aunt Regina. Wow. My son said, Mom, this is better than yours. And he wasn't even ashamed to say it. <laughs> but it was, I think it was just the creaminess, creaminess of it and the, the crust. Oh, my God. It was just, oh, my God, good. Oh. Uh, and, and I just couldn't even stop to even get up. My other friend, Carolyn, kept saying, get up and tell her I couldn't move. <laughs> <laughs> well, we appreciate your call, Carolyn, and we appreciate you watching us on anotherviewradio.org. So thank you so much for your your call. And Chef, best of luck to all the ladies sitting there. I'm, I'll support them in any way I can, but Regina, you've got my lifeline. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, Thank you. Carolyn. Thank you, Carolyn, for the call. We appreciate that. Chef Dedra, food brings people together, doesn't it? Yes, it does. So how do you, so if, if you're not used to, you know, not everybody had a great cook in their family and so forth, but what are some of the ways that we can encourage our listeners to start to create their own food memories? The best way to create your own food memories is to go into your kitchen and turn your stove on. Cook something. Uh, because food memories, they don't, they can't be found in Applebee's or TGI Fridays and places like, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with those places mm -hmm. and restaurants in general, mm -hmm. but a, you know, growing up, all of us have memories and we say, my mom or my dad or my grandma made that. And what I'm noticing, the kids nowadays don't have that. Mm -hmm. um, they don't have anything to kind of uh, cling on to because cooking is, um, covers all the senses. So it's not just taste, it's sight, it's smell, it's everything. You think the candle market is booming with food scented candles. Good well, your candy. house smells mm -hmm. like food, but nobody's cooking anything. Mm -hmm. So if you want your house to smell like food, cook, cook something. something. Mm -hmm. And whatever it is, it doesn't matter. If, if it's only one thing that you make real well, make it. You know, a lot of people don't know how to cook. Um, a lot of women went out mm -hmm. over the past 15, 20 years to try to go up the corporate ladder, but nobody was cooking at home. So now their children don't know how to cook and they're intimidated by it. But I tell my friends, I have one friend I love her dearly. When I met her, she could make nothing. Now she's got about five things. And I told her, make those five things until I give you the sixth one. <laughs> and then you can that in until I give you number seven. But that's what it's all about. Now, Deborah, you yes. you run more the business side of the business. But yes. do you cook also? I do. So, so <laughs> well, there's such pain in your voice when you say that. I don't like to. I don't. Because I grew up with her. Uh, I, when I was a kid, I didn't even have to make myself a sandwich because she'd say, I'd make a regular sandwich and she, she'd say, heat it up. Put some butter on the bread. I don't see you do it. So she fed me, literally, you know. <laughs> it, it didn't even matter. You so know? she was the one who could always dress it up a little bit always, more for you. Always, always. Mm -hmm. If it was a, whatever it was, she had to put her little spin on it. And my daughters, I have one daughter who is like me, who could care less about cooking. And then my 10-year-old is her child. Mm -hmm. You know, she will try anything. She is just a foodie. I have to move food away from her or else she's just, she said, Mom, it's just so good. I, it's yeah. just so I said Erin you're going to burst mm -hmm. you're going to burst she just loves even as a baby she would put baby food in her mouth and just move it around wow you know? so, that is great but I, I can cook she has taught me very well mm -hmm. um, she went to culinary school and she taught she loves to teach people what to do and she's taught me almost everything she knows so let's go back to those people who are really intimidated by the kitchen you know give give us a sense of what's one simple thing that if you've never cooked before in your life that you can try and have some success okay <laughs> grilled cheese um my one friend my five dish friend mm -hmm. uh would make grilled cheese for her son and he didn't know any better on um in the microwave okay bread oh. cheese folded over in the microwave he came to my house to stay for a week and he's never had grilled cheese in the microwave again so he says, Mommy, I didn't know you could make grilled cheese and it was brown. So I told her, I said, okay, this is very basic. Heat the pan, add the butter, 
Put the bread in, put the cheese in, put the oven over, flip it over. Just try it. You know, do something different. What do you think makes people afraid? I think it's um, recipes are written for chefs. They're not written for the average everyday person. Mm. So, you know, chefs, we like to impress people. Um, so a lot of times we want to make it seem like it's harder than it really is because if it looks hard, then you won't do it and I will always have a job. Food Network also makes right. people intimidated because they mm -hmm. have these chefs in there. They just don't have a regular, ordinary person in there. Mm. And so a lot of times I'll so tell So they see all the chopping mm -hmm. and all the, right, the right. things that are going on. Right. People and, go, I can't do that. And they don't do have that. the fancy knives. You know, they don't know a serrated knife from a butter knife. So, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, it, it makes them afraid to even try. 440-2665 or 1-800-940-2240. Give us a call and let us know what your challenges are in the kitchen. We've got three women here who are food experts, foodies, and they can help <laughs> you in that endeavor. 440 Two six six five or one eight hundred nine four zero two two four zero. Danita joins us from Newport News. Hi, Danita. You're on the air. Good afternoon. Thank you for taking my call. Uh huh. Um, I have a funny story to share about food. Um, my dad would make meatloaf, and I had um, three sisters and my mom, and everybody loved it. But my dad was one of those ones that would come in and out to home and all that kind of stuff. And so one time he left, and I was about fifteen. And we used to call it his meatloaf, yum, yum, meatloaf. That's how good it was. <laughs> and we, um, I said I was going to make it. And I cooked. My mom was really sick, so I would cook. I was like, I'm the oldest daughter, so I always cooked everything when he wasn't there and she couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. So I decided I'm going to make this meatloaf. Never having made meatloaf before, I make the meatloaf, put it in the oven, get it to the table, and my mom and my sisters are there, and my mom takes a spoonful, and it is the nastiest thing that you can imagine. <laughs> it is so disgusting. All of us trying to swallow it, but it's gross. <laughs> and finally, my mom takes a spoonful and just throws it at me. <laughs> and we have a full-fledged food fight with peas, mashed potatoes, and meatloaf in our kitchen. <laughs> For forever, I wouldn't make meatloaf ever again. I think within, I'm 38 now, maybe... Four years ago, I tried it, and it was really, really good. So everybody likes my meatloaf now, but when I was 15, it was horrible. You know what, Danita, that is such a great story, and, and it reminds me of a story also because I tried at 10 to bake a cake for my mother's birthday. And I didn't know that you're not supposed to mix self-rising flour with regular oh, flour. Oh, big difference. <laughs> and <Yes>. <laughs> so it, it, it looked so pretty and everything. And everybody took a little bite. And then they just kind of pushed the plates to the side. <laughs> but you know what we did uh, about a week later when we decided to throw the cake away. And when we threw it in the trash can, it went stonk. <laughs> <laughs> so I can appreciate what you went through. Thanks for sharing, Danita. We appreciate that so much. Fran joins us from Virginia Beach. Hi, Fran. You're on the air. Hey, oh, thanks for taking my call. Mm -hmm. um, I used to teach at Johnson and Wales. Uh, definitely not cooking. I taught English. <laughs> and one of my assignments was uh, food memories. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. to, for them to write about. I taught English. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was really interesting. Most of the students had remembered, you know, standing next to their grandmother on a stool, you know, and helping cook and learning from the grandmother. Uh, but one gal, um, she talked about what a bad cook her mother was. Uh-oh. And, <laughs> and figured, and she thought she was a good cook because she put cheese Whiz on everything. <laughs> <laughs> So um, oh. it was an interesting assignment for them. Oh, I can imagine. I'm <laughs> sure. <laughs> Regina, what do you do if you are, as you're experimenting with your pies and so forth, and one doesn't turn out quite like you expect it to? Well, I, I think, first of all, there's once you get the basic ingredients down, there's no such thing as a bad pie. It may not look the way you want it to look, but the taste is usually excellent. Mm -hmm. And I've just discovered sometimes even if I have uh, like a little bit of dough left, you know, I can roll it out and just make a free form galad or crostata or something like that. So essentially, I mean, you know, I, I used to, when I first started making pies, you know, I'd, I'd roll out the crust or maybe I was making hand pies and I have some scraps left and I'd kind of like toss and I'm going, oh my God, what a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> what a mistake. Because you can just take it and create something right. else with mm -hmm. it. And so, um, you know, I just really, I haven't met a bad pie that I have made. 
So um, essentially, they're all good. So okay, give us give us not without giving away your secrets. Okay. and I understand that. <laughs> but but what makes what is the difference between a really good pie? And a bad pie. What is there an ingredient that well, people do or miss? You or? know, I, th- I think, and Detra can probably speak this to this more um, as a culinary expert. There are probably three or four different uh, basic pie crusts that you can make, and once you get those down, everything mm-hmm. else is just derivations of what you might want to put in the pie. Mm-hmm. But if you know, if you want to do you know, like a basic pie crust that may be an all butter crust, or you can do a combination of butter or you know Crisco or something like that that'll give you a particular type of crust and then maybe if you're moving more into making um, more of a um, crostata or or kind of a, a cookie type crust cookie type then mm-hmm. you might go more all butter or maybe mm-hmm. use sour cream or move, use um, cream cheese or something just makes the texture a little bit different mm-hmm. but once you get and I guess kind of the French it's the technique the, the French technique mastered is, yeah. you know here's here's what the ingredients are and then of course there, there's a technique of rolling the dough and understanding exactly you know what temperature the butter needs mm-hmm. to be you know it's, it's mm-hmm. a lot of it i mean when you look at most pie crust recipes i mean there you can pick up probably any really good um cookbook and you'll have some basic pie crust recipes they're only working with three or four ingredients right and so the rest of, of the it is ingredients pure, is cold water cold water mm. believe it or not water. cold water mm. that you know. makes the difference and then the rest of it is kind of mm. learning how to roll the crust out mm. and not you know why beating does it cold up. water make the difference what is that because most of us like and we're attracted to flaky crust mm-hmm. and if the butter is not cold enough it's not going to be flaky it's going to kind of mash into it like a cookie Mm-hmm. So that cold oh. water or water with a little bit of ice in it is going to give you that flakiness um, mm-hmm. in between the the flour. Oh wow! See, yeah. there's a there's a tip for you all yeah. out there as you're as you're ready to to start your mm-hmm. holiday <coughs> cooking or everyday cooking for that matter. <laughs> we, our lines are lit up, so let's go to Lori in Chesapeake. Hi, Lori, you're on the air. Hi. Hi. Hey. Yeah. Um, I wanted to share with you guys. Um, my dad had told me about this website. Uh, it's called MyRecipes.com, uh-huh. and it's great if, if you need dinner ideas because every day they email you a dinner idea. And if you're a little intimidated about cooking, they actually they have a video and it shows you how to make each dinner for each day. And it's it's really awesome for somebody who wants to try some new dishes but are a little intimidated on ingredients or how to cook certain things. You can just watch the video and and it's mm. great. Every day you get a dinner idea and you don't know how to cook it, you they step you through it. It's really great. Okay, what's great the idea. website again, Lori? It's it's called myrecipes.com and okay. you can sign up for it and they have different uh, different things you can do. I signed up for the daily dinner and, okay. and Let- it's great. And I tell you what, most of the dishes I make come from this site because they're really good. Usually pretty healthy and easy to fix and and I told my daughter because I was I was one of those women that was going to school, working full time and just making something quick on the go. So Mm -hmm. I never really, unfortunately, taught her how to cook very well. (laughs) And I said, well, go to the site, Dominique. You can learn how to cook dinner, too. (laughs) Well, let me ask you something, too. Now that that you're using the site and so forth, are you more adventuresome in the kitchen? Will you try some things on your own? Yes. Yes, definitely. I mean, just learning different combinations of of spices and herbs. And I've even started substituting some of the chicken dishes now with some of the tofu and, and other things. So I'm definitely getting more... Uh, daring. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks for sharing, Lori. We appreciate that phone call. Yeah, Chef yeah, Dr., let me ask you a question. What is? Can you give give us an idea, if you are a working mom, as she was, um, or you're out and you're really busy, what's a quick dinner that you can cook, that you can actually come home, <laughs> get on the, <laughs> on the table before 10 o'clock at night? Right. <laughs> You know, and and still feed your family something that's homemade right. as opposed to. I think one of the most common misconceptions about being a chef is they think that my family eats at this big old spreaded table, this Norman Rockwell <laughs> type of picture. <laughs> it's not true. So my life is just as busy as everybody else's. Mm-hmm. So I run into those same obstacles. Um, I would say whatever your family starch is, if it's rice, pasta, potato, you know that works fine. Any pasta dish will work fine. Um, you know, cook some pasta saute your vegetables and pan your chicken breast you can cut up and add to the dish with me cooking is not the obstacle preparation is the obstacle because you mm. go to the grocery store with high with high hopes good intentions and a full wallet and you go and you buy all these groceries you come home two weeks later you've got rotten vegetables to throw away because you're you know you ran out of preparation time so i think that when people go to the grocery store 
when they get home, rest for a few minutes, but then get in there, go ahead and break it into smaller portions, cut up what they can because it's so much easier just to grab. Mm -hmm. You know, that's why restaurant food comes out so fast because it's already prepped. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't take long at all. So preparation is the key. That Saturday when you go out and get your groceries, come in, chop it up, marinate your chicken breast or whatever, then that way uh, putting the meal together okay. is a lot quicker. What was that's that expression you said about everything in place? Mise en place. Mise en place. Mise en place. <laughs> Everything <laughs> in place. I love it. If you're just joining us, we're talking about food memories with Regina Brayboy, founder and owner of Coastal Pies, and Chef Dedra Blount and Blount and her sister Deborah Bradson, owners of Now Your Cooking Culinary Institute. 440-2665 or 1-800-940-2240. Give us a call if you have any questions about your upcoming Thanksgiving dinner. If you want to get some tips on how to get that dinner on the table, everything hot at one time. Good, good. That's I want to hear this <laughs> myself. But let's go to Joanne in, on the Eastern Shore. Oh, they have great food on the Eastern Shore. <laughs> Hi, Joanne. You're on the air. Hi there. Hi. I'm, I'm really enjoying the show. Thank you. I just I wanted to uh, pass along after listening to the meatloaf story. I have to tell you that uh, <laughs> my girls, uh, I have five daughters, and I would say four out of five of them have uh, inadvertently made uh, box brownies with olive oil. Ooh. Oh. And uh, <laughs> and <laughs> taking them taking them off to the high school. Or the basketball team, or whatever. Oh. And then come home later that night and said they had to throw all my brownies in the trash because it, I made them with olive oil. And I said, "Yeah, I, it, did you see it said vegetable oil on that recipe?" But anyway, so that was a funny. <laughs> 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 okay, I'm curious. What kind of texture does a brownie made in olive oil have? <laughs> Uh, it's not the texture, it's, it's the, the taste. taste. Oh. It's the taste. Oh. We, my husband is Spanish, so we use uh, mostly extra virgin olive oil mm -hmm. in our house. And I can tell you that chocolate cannot be redeemed by extra virgin <laughs> olive oil. It is, it's just falling. The texture is definitely not the problem. Wow. But I, I, I wanted to say that, you know, my experience with my mom was, she was always so intimidated uh, by other cooks. And I think that, unfortunately, we just tend to pass down our intimidation. So I, I decided to go the other extreme. I try new recipes, and then my excuse is, you know, this is a brand new recipe. If it's a disaster, well, you know, what the heck? <laughs> so it makes me a little bit more adventuresome when I can just say, Oh, this is a new recipe. What do you think? And, uh... <laughs> Thanks so much for the call, Joanne. We really appreciate it. Let's go to Bonnie in Chesapeake. Hi, Bonnie. You're on the air. Hi. Thank you for taking my call. Sure. Um, I just wanted to share a memory. Uh, my parents and grandparents have since gone on, and every Thanksgiving, we would usually have it the Sunday after Thanksgiving. Um, and we would get the ham and the turkey and everything on the table, and we would have to take a picture of the table before they would let us eat. <laughs> and I look back through um, photo albums now and see the food pictures, and it just kind of makes me giggle that we live to eat instead of ate to live. <laughs> oh, that's great. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Thanks for sharing that, Bonnie. That is that is a great story. Carolyn joins us from Chesapeake. Hi, Carolyn. You're on the air. Hi there. Thank you so much. I love the program, and today's is especially wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> um, I've loved listening to everyone else's stories. My grandmother, as a, with a, most everyone who's spoken, is the person who I learned to cook from. Mm -hmm. And I um, we, I used to. She used to give me that ball of dough, and I made little people, <laughs> <laughs> dough boys, as they, as we called them. But my, I, um, and I also love hot potato salad. To the lady that likes hot potato salad, <laughs> mine comes out looking more like mashed potatoes by the time I'm done, and it's wonderful. <laughs> but um, my question is, my grandmother used to make the best ever apple turnovers. Her crust was was uh, flaky and lovely, and she made it in a skillet on the stove. Hmm. Now that I have purchased a new stove that has the glass top, I was appalled to learn that you can't use ca you're not supposed to use cast iron on those top stove tops. Ooh, really? Yeah. No. So what <laughs> can I do to get that wonderful flakiness that my grandmother got with her fried pies? 
now that I have this new so-called improved. <laughs> so sometimes the newest stuff is not the best for cooking. You're right about That's that. True. It's Good beautiful, point. but it doesn't it doesn't do the job. Yeah. I would suggest um, you can go online and look for a portable butane burner. Burner. I think every household should have one. And they range it in price from about twenty to about thirty-five bucks, but it takes a little um, butane canister on the side. It comes in its own little case, and you can sit it on a table, and then you can use your cast iron in the household, or you could take it to someone else's mm -hmm. house. You can camp with it or whatever. So it gives mm -hmm. you the versatility that the new induction and um, all the other fancy electric ranges won't won't let you have. So it allows you to cook over fire, yes, basically. over direct flame, and it's okay. a little butane yeah. burner. Regina, you know, one of the things I think is interesting that we've all been and talking about our food memories is we've been talking about our grandmothers, mm -hmm. and um, even though I'm not a grandmother, but I do think it's going to be interesting for the generation that's coming after us when they look back to say, "My grandmother made this." Yes. You know, what are they going to what say? Are they going to say, my grandmother <laughs> went to the store and <laughs> right. bought we went to microwaves to raise. Exactly. Exactly. So I wonder That's if we're going to lose point. a lot of um, food traditions yes, and food memories. Are. I mean, are, is this going to be the generation where, but, you know, maybe that's turning around, but clearly that this could be a gener yeah. the lost generation yeah. of food memories mm -hmm. you know you know and I, I hope though with the with the whole resurgence of of the foodie movement basically mm -hmm. and and people paying more attention to buying ingredients close to home and and trying to um, eat healthier and so forth that that hopefully mm -hmm. that will um, bring that next generation along even mm -hmm. I tell you it's, it's interesting because I tried to pass on the the um, German chocolate cake and bacon thing to my daughter who doesn't like coconut or nuts so that didn't work <laughs> yeah. but my grandbaby loves it mm -hmm. yeah. but what? again I didn't cook it that's that's Gigi that's, right. that's yeah. the great grandma <laughs> yeah. absolutely okay we have a question from Nick in Yorktown who has some mac and cheese issues huh Nick yeah, hi hello hi um, I'm trying to um uh, we, we have every Wednesday night is guinea pig night in our family, and if anybody <laughs> wants to try love that. a new recipe, you you invite them over and you say, okay, here's what we're trying tonight. And we're we've been looking for a recipe for uh, mac and cheese, but made with pepper jack instead of regular cheese. And I thought just prepare it the regular way, but my daughter-in-law said, no, 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 because pepper jack is a different kind of cheese than cheddar. It melts entirely differently. You'll ruin it. You have to make a sauce first and all that. So. Uh, and we can't find a recipe for mac and cheese using pepper jack anywhere. Now, the second question was my grandmother, uh, I'm 65, by the way, so this goes back, uh, was Hungarian. She used to make chicken pepper cash, mm -hmm. and there's part of the recipe requires a roux where you use a little bit of bacon grease, uh, chicken broth, flour, uh, uh, sour cream, and paprika, and you make this roux out of it. And I can't, she would just do it like she wasn't even thinking it would come out perfect. Uh, and then every time I try and do it, I don't know what I'm going wrong, the heat, or I'm, I'm mixing the ingredients in the wrong proportions at the wrong time or whatever. But I have a lot of trouble with just making a roux. Okay, let's sauce. let, let's let <laughs> Chef, right. Chef Dedrick Jeff give Dedrick me some help Jeff here. I'm, I'm coming I'm to your jumping rescue. in my chair. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, the mac and cheese issue, you don't need a separate recipe because cheddar and um, pepper jack will melt the same. So what you do is make your mac and cheese Add your pepper jack, add it, add half of it, and just incorporate it little by little. Taste it. If it doesn't, if it's not enough, add a little bit more. You know, instead of dumping it all in. But you don't need any other type of uh, recipe. Um, you just gotta experiment with it. Maybe use it for the guinea pig night, so that way you can just kind of add <laughs> bits and pieces at a time. Now, chicken um, pepper cash recipe. What you're doing wrong? Um, you need to do your bacon grease and your flour together first. Once you get that mixed together, then add your stock to it and the um, and the paprika. And then the last thing you want to add is your sour cream. Before you add the sour cream, turn the flame down because real sour cream at high heat is going to separate. So it may taste good, but it doesn't look good. If you are trying to reduce the fat, use reduced fat or fat-free sour cream, which does not separate. So you can take reduced fat or fat-free sour cream and bring it to a boil and it will still have the same finish. So flour, uh, fat, flour, paprika, stock, sour cream. Okay, I hope that helps, Nick. Thanks so much for the call. We've got lots of calls. You ladies are really staring <laughs> up things. Yeah. I tell you, Carol joins us from Suffolk. Hi, Carol. You're on the air. Hi, how are you? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for the show. It's wonderful. Oh, thank but you. I wanted to um, comment on 
the comment about our grandmothers and what we might be losing. Um, unfortunately, I did not have grandmothers that lived anywhere near me to teach me how to cook, and my children also do not. However, you know, we make things like homemade potato soup or homemade chili, mm-hmm. and I bring my boys in, and, um, you know, we go, we look at the recipe, and I teach them how to mash the potatoes and how to, you know, put the milk in. So I think that sometimes if we're, you know, we're so spread out geographically these days mm-hmm. that maybe it's a good idea for parents to bring their children in and concentrate. I like, I'm really, I'm a big fan of real food and, you know, cooking from scratch and um, it's healthier, it's better for us, it's better for our family as a, as a unit, um, just for get togetherness. And I think that's, that's something that we're losing in this, let's go grab something to eat, let's go to the store and pick up processed foods. So getting back to cooking and cooking together as a family and enjoying a meal, sitting down together as a family, I think is something that we're losing as a society, and it's such a vital piece of memories and family togetherness. Absolutely, and family absolutely. Right, and I thank think, you for sharing that, Carol. Yeah, and the husbands are getting in the kitchen too, so yes, granddad might be the one who passes <laughs> right. on some food memories. That is something. a really good point <laughs> because thank you, Mr. Lee, because if it were not for him, there would be no home cooking in the Same Ham thing. Lee household. Mr. Bray Boy. <laughs> Keith joins us from Chesapeake. Hi, Keith. You're on the air. Good morning. Good morning. Or afternoon. Yeah. <laughs> We're having yeah, such I'd a good like time. To, <laughs> I'd like to share a uh, my first experience when I was dating my wife with, uh, I think it was Valentine's Day. We were getting together, her daughter, myself, and uh, I think one other person. And she told me I had to make something for dinner. So, you know, I asked her what she liked. She said shrimp, seafood, whatever. And unbeknownst to myself, I said, well, you know, Let's try this seafood soup, which we better know as a this. And mm-hmm. I told her I'd not make that, I'm not knowing what type of uh, task I'd undertake. <laughs> he so picked I a made, really hard not, one, didn't he? he? <laughs> yeah, actually, for me it was. Um, so I took and I pretty much did everything the night before and um, uh, combined it. And then the day of, uh, reheated it and finished it. And, uh, and I'm sitting there thinking, well, I have to look for a new girlfriend after this one. <laughs> and end up, she married me. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. good story. Uh, <laughs> hey, well, I got lucky once. Uh, <laughs> but the lady I, earlier that said she uses a, my, uh, my recipes or something mm-hmm. dot com, that's, that's a really good site. There's another one out there uh, that I came across uh in the shrimp biscuits where I got it from is called allrecipes.com. And the good thing about it is it allows you to set up uh, meals for the week or however. It gives you a shopping list for whatever you're doing. But it also allows you different types of diets, whether you're a diabetic or whatever. And it allows you to adjust the portions you type in. I want it. I seen one in there for 16 people. All you do is change it from 16 to 4. And poof, you now have the, it readjusts you know, for you. That's you know, fantastic. It's really, it's really good site. And uh, to let you know, me and my wife fix everything pretty much. Use fresh vegetables and everything like that every night. And mm-hmm. our dinners take anywhere from thirty minutes to an hour at the very most to cook everything fresh. Fantastic. We have to cook things for four people because it's hard to cook things for two. Yeah, so. And you're in there together spending time. Keith, thanks so much for sharing your food memory. We appreciate that. And since people are mentioning websites and so forth, we can't forget Let's Eat, mm-hmm. which is a part of WHRO.org, where we encourage all of you out there to contribute your recipes, contribute your thoughts about cooking. Um, it's a great site where there are all kinds of ideas on ways to prepare foods, um, to buy fresh vegetables, to figure out how to use a, a vegetable mm-hmm. you've never used before, et cetera. For, um, and I think we have one last call from Heather in Norfolk. Hi, Heather, you're on the air. Hi, um, thanks for taking my call. Uh-huh. I grew, I was blessed to grow up with grandparents, both um, grandfathers, grandmothers, mom, dad, that cooked. We had big Sunday dinners, and we started Saturday morning for those. We'd make a huge pot of spaghetti and meatballs that would last the entire week. We'd bake a ham, and we'd make sure we had scalloped potatoes 
and pea soup. We didn't let anything go to waste, and we would make it last. So you'd always have a good home-cooked meal, always leftovers or something with the ham and the peas and the potatoes. But my happiest memory, one of my happiest memories, was, and I'll cry, was going up to Sandy Hook, Connecticut, where unfortunately we had our national tragedy to my grandmother's cottage that my Swedish grandfather built by hand, and it had an outhouse and everything. And we Mm. would go up there, and she would put in a frozen chicken dinner with peas and frozen potatoes, because I peeled so many potatoes in my life, I can't tell you. <laughs> and those were, those tasted so good to me, rather than fresh potatoes, those frozen ones. We'd sit up and put out a TV tray and watch Florence Welk on her little black and white <laughs> And thank you for letting me share that. Oh, story. that's <laughs> such a beautiful story. <laughs> She was born in 1901, and she lived 89 years. Oh, wow. She was, born, she was born in Prairie du Chien, Wisconsin, and had her babies in Ecolacta, Montana, her three daughters, when she was 18. Mm. And then she had to move back to Rockford, Illinois, and then they had to move back to Bridgeport, Connecticut, and she didn't like being in the city. So her husband, he died at 60, but he built by hand this little cottage up in of Connecticut, and she volunteered in the library at that elementary school. Oh, thank you, Heather, for sharing that. Yes, no, so I really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. But you know, food man, that's what that's what this does. When right. people <laughs> come together and mm-hmm. families come together, it gives you something to hold on to. Okay, we got about six minutes left. So, uh, Regina, I want to talk about your pies again for just a second mm-hmm. because um, I know that you bake them. I know they're full of really good ingredients. It might not necessarily be diet ingredients are they? <laughs> well you know actually I, I really you know one of the things is really good once you have a really good crust which I think is the foundation for the mm-hmm. pie I mean you really don't have to over depend on you know a lot of sugar and all that kind of stuff I try to make sure I have good spices you know use things like orange and lemon zest so that you're really bringing out the flavor Flavors of whether good. you're using you know fruits or vegetables and I find that that's what really people want is the you know the, right. the wonderful mm-hmm. flavor you'll get some sweetness from you know, every now and then. But, you know, like I said, I'm doing savory pies as well, which can be a lot of vegetables, can be chicken, that type of thing. So really trying to keep it, you know, giving you a range of taste to um, to appeal okay. to. Mm. I want to ask you, Chef Dedra, um, the one trick to get all the food on the table <laughs> hot. For Thanksgiving, are you yes, talking about? For Thanksgiving. <laughs> well, again, what is the planning, trick? Planning is the key. I mean... <laughs> When, when I'm getting ready either for parties or for Thanksgiving, you know, I've got a thing that looks like a football playlist with all these different things going <laughs> at different times. You have to be mindful of, okay, some things don't need to be made that night. Um, I want everybody to be able to come to Thanksgiving. If, if you're hosting, you should be at the dinner also, not, not in the cooking. kitchen. <laughs> yeah, not stuck by yourself. <laughs> you know, so certain things like um, partially cooking, your ham or assembling, you know, slicing and assembling um, casseroles and things like that that you can just run back in the oven. Not everyone has the luxury to have more than one oven, Mm -hmm. you know, so take advantage of every crock pot, roaster, (laughs) slow cooker (laughs) that you have and have them lined up on your counters, you know, put your sauces in one. But I think um, making things ahead of time, like we have fresh cranberry sauce that I make two days ahead of time because it tastes better two days later. Mm -hmm. But you know, that's one of the things that I can make ahead. And, and things you know, like greens and, and, and stuff that and, you can right, cook ahead of time. because everything is made from scratch. You know, there mm-hmm. is no open a box and, or open a glory green can. <laughs> we go to the farmer and get the greens. And, <laughs> you know, so it should be next week is going to be the week when people need to start gathering the mise en place right. and mm-hmm. getting <laughs> everything ready. Mm-hmm. So that way they know, okay, Monday night do this, Tuesday do this. So that way they're ready and they can actually be yes. calm and be a part and of Deborah, what are you bringing to the table for macaroni Thanksgiving macaroni and cheese you're doing the mac yes. and cheese always, always. Oh, <laughs> that is her. see so you do have a specialty I do. I, I do but I don't like to bring it out I don't have to <laughs> <laughs> everybody has their dish and whatever you do if it's one dish do it well yes mm-hmm. that's all I ask we have it is do it well we don't do low fat dishes no we don't we like real food <laughs> because when you eat real food you don't have to eat a whole lot of it you know mm. would you like to have a whole lot of something that's bad tasting you know something that you have to say oh it's not that bad i don't want to eat that's not bad anything Mm -hmm. i'd rather have a small sliver of something that's so good that i need to close my eyes and just be alone 
<laughs> you know, that's, that's the kind of what's food I want in South Carolina. The women with the women with their eyes are being alone. Yeah, yeah, being alone. <laughs> now, uh, Deborah and Dedra, you all you do cooking classes, yes, cooking and classes. so forth. Tell us a little bit about that so people can find our you. Our responsibility mm-hmm. is to help people to learn more about food, teach the kids how to cook, have quality time, couples time. Um, our website is nowyouarecooking.com. Now the letter U, mm-hmm. the letter R, R cooking dot com. And okay. we um we do and we'll have that on our website at another view radio very basic org. classes um you know how to sauce one on one how to stir fry vegetables very basic things that you can customize so you know we really want people to get back in their kitchens and stop using their kitchens as a show place for really pretty pots and pans <laughs> and we want them to cook some food so that our children. Um, so they're going to be feeding us up. later. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. That's, that is true. <laughs> they will be feeding us I'm, later. I'm not, not going to eat ramen in my latter days. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I want some filet mignon. And, and it is up to us to create these food memories for our kids, and, just and like our grandparents and parents did for us. what real food tastes like. Right. You know, yes. the more and more you live and the more news you get of what a McRib is made out of and what a hamburger, you know, that there has to be an alternative. Right, and I teach, you know, for a living right now, I teach preschool. And whenever we're talking about vegetables and fruit, they get their fruit and vegetables in a can. But whenever it's something new, I always bring the actual fruit or vegetable with me so they can see what a pineapple looks like. Mm -hmm. You know, you'd be surprised how many of these children eat out of a can. They have no idea. You know, we talked about chicken. Where are the nuggets? You know, Mm. they're like, what? The chicken pieces (laughs) instead. (laughs) And Regina, how do people get your pies? Uh, they can certainly email me at okay. rbrayboy at outlook.com. That's a starting point. Okay. Um, Coastalpies.com will be a web, is our website, and that's going to be And up. it's coming up very shortly. Part okay. Facebook. And, and, and oh, my gosh, on I'm on Facebook. Yeah, yes. you can you can friend me on Facebook. Um, and we're also working on shipping because, you know, my friends in South Carolina this weekend were like, yo, can you ship to my mother in Texas? <laughs> and can you ship to me in Los Angeles? Okay. And so we're working on that as well. So, so. we've got Regina Brayboy with uh, Coastal Pies mm-hmm. and Chef Dedra Blunt and Deborah Brapson with Now Your Cooking Culinary Institute. Ladies, thank you so much oh, okay. for joining us. And I know that the food, I'm coming to each one of your houses <laughs> <Okay>. that day <laughs> just to grab a bite. And stay with us, everyone. We'll be right back. I'm with Marcellus, and you all are checking out Another View on WHRV 89.5. Don't go anywhere. Check us out. And I bet Wynton Marsalis is going to have a great Thanksgiving dinner, too. How about that? The year Josephine McBride was born, America only had 46 states. Henry Ford rolled out the Model T, and the Wright brothers were able to keep their flying machines in the air for 40 minutes at a time. Yes, the centenarian's life reads like a history book, and she recently shared some of her experiences with our Lisa Godley. Josephine McBride was five years old when Woodrow Wilson was installed as the nation's 28th president. But we are here to destroy the control over the industry of other people. By the time she was 12, Calvin Coolidge was running the country and the 19th Amendment had passed, giving women the right to vote. We shall It would be another 30 years before the civil rights movement would enable African Americans to actually cast a vote. That legislation was signed into law by President Lyndon B. Johnson. The same year, Josephine McBride turned 56. But the 105-year-old Norfolk resident is quick to point out that the commander-in-chief who's meant the most to her wasn't elected until she was a century old. I, Barack Hussein Obama, do solemnly swear that I will... Well, I'll say that the president that has meant most to me, of course, uh, President Obama, because I think I never lived, thought that I would live to see a black president, a black man be president. So that has been more to me than all the others, even though I love uh, Kennedy, Carter, Nixon, not Nixon. 
There's no denying that Josephine McBride has seen a lot in her life. She was trained as a nurse at Lincoln Hospital in Durham, North Carolina, and took a nursing position at Norfolk Community Hospital in 1937. She was 29 at the time. Well, when I was coming along, now, this is a long story, too. <clears throat> when I became a nurse, you didn't have to have your BS or your whatever, the education, other education, your master's or whatnot. Because when you finish, if you were a good nurse, you were just a good nurse. And you didn't have to have all that education. She says she married late in life. So I had my babies after I was 35. And I did have twins. One thing many people don't know about Josephine McBride is that during the Jim Crow era, she once had a Rosa Parks moment of her own. I did get arrested when I tried to get through the bus and go to the, the he wanted to send me, send me to the back of the bus and I wouldn't get off. And I was coming into the bus and the bus, at that time the bus was full, but I could get in the bus, so why should I get out the bus and go to the back? I had my pass and you weren't supposed to get off the bus and go to the back and come in the back door anyway. Josephine McBride's fiery spirit and determination is what caused her to become the oldest person to graduate from Norfolk Citizens Police Academy at 101 years old. As part of her training, she fired a gun and hit her target. Well, after I joined and finished the course, a lot of people finished after me, older people, because they said if I could do it, they could do it too. So they, took, they went to the academy and took the training after I did, and it was fun for me. I met a lot of people, and they have continued to be my friend. Since then, they have kept up with me, and it has been fun. Can't wait to see what Josephine McBride does next. For another view, I'm Lisa Godley. And Mrs. McBride is 105 years old and still going strong and is still involved in the academy, in uh, the Police Auxiliary Academy. What an incredible woman. I tell you, that is something else. Just a quick reminder, I hope to see you tomorrow at the Senior Services of Southeastern Virginia's Medicare Health Fair and Expo. It's at the Virginia Beach Convention Center from 8 until 3.30. There will be panel discussions and workshops full of information you may need, especially if you are age 50 or, or older. Go to SSS, Sam, 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 EVA.org to register. I'm serving as moderator for the panel discussion, so be sure to come up and say hello. I'd sure love to see you. And that's it for today's show. If you'd like to hear it again, visit anotherviewradio.org and download our podcast. And while you're there, you can sign up for our eView newsletter. It's a once a week reminder of upcoming programs. And please like us on Facebook. <laughs> we would really appreciate it. Our theme music was composed and performed by Jay Sennett. Lisa Godley is our show producer. Victor Bowen is our audio engineer. And Alexandra Pumphrey, she's one of our former our intern. She has answered our phones today. Thanks so much for sharing your food memories with us. We really, really appreciated it. And I hope you all have a fantastic weekend. And let's get together again next Friday at noon for another view.